here's what Donald Trump was doing over the weekend. Again, I wonder if he'll be asked about this. Pushing false claims, threatening anyone who does not support him. In a post on Saturday, the former president warned he would try to imprison anyone who engages in, quote, unscrupulous behavior during this year's race. Oh, and, and, what does he mean by uh, that? Of course, people that aren't supporting him. Right. Right. Political Yesterday, operatives, lawyers, donors. Yeah. Yesterday, he continued to amplify false information about the 2020 election by referencing an outlandish claim from the far right that 20 percent of Pennsylvania's mail-in ballots were fraudulent. Well, of course, those mail-in ballots haven't even started to be sent in yet. And these these are the type of lies Chris Christie said he started telling in early 2020 because he thought he was going to lose. And so, he said that the more he realized he was going to lose in the spring of 2020, the more he started amplifying those lies. And he's doing it now. If I had an opportunity to ask him questions or moderate anything, I would start probably with, or with whether the 2020 election was stolen, but then head straight to this, because this is the heart of the matter between these two candidates, not his made-up policies on child care that make no sense. On Friday, Trump spoke to the Fraternal Order of Police and encouraged officers to watch for voter fraud because... Voters would be afraid of them. You want to run a country that is based on fair and free voting? You're in serious trouble if you get caught trying to find out what are the real results of an election. It's an amazing thing. Do you ever see that? They go after the people that are looking at the crime, and they do terrible things to them. But the people that committed the voter fraud and everything, they can do whatever they want to do. It's so crazy. And I hope you, as the greatest people, I, the, just as great as there is anybody in their country, I hope you watch for voter fraud. Uh, so it starts early, you know. It starts in a week. But I hope you can watch and you're all over the place. Watch for the voter fraud, because we win. Without voter fraud, we win so easily. Hopefully, we're going to win anyway, but we want to keep it down. You can keep it down just by watching, because Believe it or not, they're afraid of that badge. They're afraid of you people. They're afraid of that more than anything else. They're afraid. So I hope you can watch. Well, they can watch all they want. You know, Donald Trump's own staff members watched in 2020. And do you know what they said? The person who was in charge of actually watching the election that Donald Trump put in charge, Chris Krebs said it was the cleanest, fairest election on record. Of course, Donald Trump, every day. see, and this is the thing. People go, oh, I don't know what to believe because Donald Trump says this, but then I turn on this cable news channel that's lying for 24 hours a day on the right, and they tell me that what he's saying is the truth. Mm -hmm. Really? Or you, they don't talk about it. You know him. what the truth is, and you deliberately choose lies. You know what, li what the, where the light is, right. and you deliberately choose the darkness. You do it deliberately because you know, and I know, 63 federal judges said there was no evidence of any, any fraudulent behavior, any widespread voter fraud in 2020. The United States Supreme Court, time and again, refused to listen to these because there was, there was nothing there. The one time they did in a Pennsylvania case, the most conservative justices said, you know what, even if we responded to this case, it wouldn't change the outcome of the election. You had Republican officials in Michigan, Republican officials in Pennsylvania, Republican officials in Georgia, Republican officials in Arizona repeatedly say that their elections were fair, and yet the lies continue. Now, am I saying this because... I think Donald Trump's ever going to change his tactics. No, he knows he's lying. He admitted last week he was lying. He said he lost by a smidge or, or whatever he said. Uh, oh, no, I'm saying this for the people that actually continue to spread his lies and know differently. And John Heilman, you know, the, the pace uh, that has picked up so much over the past couple of weeks about Donald Trump saying, oh, they're going to steal the election, they're going to steal the election. It suggests the man doesn't have a whole lot of confidence that he's actually going to win this election. 
Right. And I think, um, you know, the, the pace, it, it is eerie, Joe, the, the way I think if you went back and looked at the timeline in 2020, uh, you would see the same thing. You know, I mean, Trump is obviously, we, we remark about it all the time, that there's never been a race that he's run where he has not uh, tried to pre-frame uh, a loss as the result of a stolen election, as a result of a fraudulent election, as a result of cheating. He did that in 2016. He did it in 2020. He did it this time. The difference between 2016 and 2020 was that in 2016, it was a relatively late phenomenon when he started to, to really lean in on that question. In 2020, he started to lay the, ground room, the groundwork a lot earlier, and he started laying it very early again this time around. And the pace right now uh, is picking up in the way that it did in the, in the immediately after Labor Day, heading into the fall uh, of 2020. And of course, we saw how that turned out. Uh, in the period after the election up to, to, to January 20th. And I, I think that there, are, there is a widespread sense of concern on the part of, uh, across parties, but on the part of everybody who cares about uh, trying to make sure that the transition of power after this election is peaceful. There's an enormous amount of concern, uh, especially in the wake of January 6th last time around with that precedent in the books that Trump is driving headlong into that again, if anything, amping it up even more so. And of course, this race uh, has been turning against him of late, and, and that makes it all the more unnerving. Uh, yeah. and, and, and let's be, again, let's be very clear that about half of Americans, mm -hmm. little less than half Americans, want to support a man who started riots and, are doing, and is doing exactly what John Hodgman said. Again. And they know, they know he's doing it. And they're completely fine with it. Not only is he sowing doubt in the election, the next step is violence right. to get people to protect him. See what you see. This is, this read what you read, but actually go to somewhere where you can get real information. It may not be obvious to people who are not regular political consumers just how much Trump lies. Take one example. The MAGA abortion crackdown, which so many people are living through, is widely opposed around the nation. It's unpopular, including in conservative states. At the last debate, Trump went out claiming how it was actually really popular. And some people could be tricked or confused by that, especially if they don't have personal experience in that. And that's just an example of something he does where then the candidate responding has to decide how much do you fact check that with your answer and rebut that and reframe that make sure people understand it's not even a red blue thing kansas didn't like his abortion policy florida has actually got a plan to try to maybe overthrow some of it legally but that's why so many candidates including republicans have found trump is hard to debate now harris for her part has shown an assertive style including on these kind of issues and truth and lies when she was in debates and running against the trump pence ticket last cycle Donald Trump, on the other hand, so, has been thanks. about covering up everything. Thanks. We're about freedom and respecting the freedom of the American people. Let's talk about respecting the American people. You respect the American people when you tell them the truth. And I think this is supposed to be a debate based on fact and truth. Donald Trump doesn't understand that because he doesn't understand what it means to be honest. Honesty, facts, truth. Truth not only as a democratic value, if you want to be high-minded, that we can debate the size of the government or the size of immigration flows or how much money we should spend on this or that, but we would have to be telling the truth about how much money. What's the point of debating it if the numbers are made up? That's sort of the active kind of obvious reason why you have truth if you're debating something. But she also went further there, and we may see that as a preview for what she does tomorrow night, trying to make sure the public understands that if the other side, as she argues it, Trump and Pence, lie about everything, then they don't respect you that this is an affront, trying to put what we might call a larger organizing structure around it. So it's not just politicians snapping at each other about each individual claim or lie, but a larger point. And to land that, she has to find ways to prove it so that people with their own eyes and ears, even if they're not super political, even if they still have questions about her, even if they haven't decided who they're voting for, start to get the sense over this hour plus, one person might be lying more, and that person doesn't respect you, as she put it. How are you going to give them power if you can't believe what they say? Now, Donald Trump has done six general election debates. Harris has done one with Pence that I just showed you. So she is trying to prep up and catch up in a way.
reporting shows they have a mock stage, they have a Trump stand-in who's unleashing the kind of harsh attacks and offensive comments that could throw even a seasoned and tough politician off, off their game if they're not used to it and prepped for it, like practicing anything else. Trump, for his part, is, quote, practicing how to respond to his expected barrage of attacks on his character, the Post reports. Now, usually campaigns slow down a bit right now in this week. Of course, the Harris campaign started later than ever because of the shift that we all know about. And because also there's a sign that this is a really tight race, Harris is still pushing all kinds of themes new this week in addition to prepping for the debate. They got that Dick Cheney endorsement last week. Now they're using their cash edge to run these new ads, I'll show you briefly, about Donald Trump and how he can't even keep the confidence of his own aides who've seen him up close and in private doing the work. I should tell you these are running on Fox News with Trump officials criticizing Trump. And they also, we know, are airing this locally in the Mar-a-Lago media market so that Donald Trump himself might catch it live. Here's his vice president. Anyone who puts himself over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. His defense secretary. Do you think Trump can be trusted with the nation's secrets ever again? No. His national security advisor. Donald Trump will cause a lot of damage. Take it from the people who knew him best. Donald Trump is a danger to our troops and our democracy. Pretty striking. And that comes again after Dick Cheney himself endorsed Harris. I want to be clear. What you're seeing here in the politics of national security and these Republicans and hawks is extraordinary. In the traditional sense of the word, extraordinary. Not ordinary, unusual, striking. And because we live through these times, I've talked to you about this before, where a lot of extraordinary, unusual things happen. Sometimes you say, well, it can't all be unusual, right? But this Cheney swing of both family members was unimaginable just eight years ago when Dick Cheney was endorsing Donald Trump. This shift of these national security experts, high-level Republicans, lifelong Republicans, hawks, saying, we've seen Donald Trump. Our number one issue is national security, and you can't give him power again because it would be dangerous to this country. That's some mood music going into this big debate. And Donald Trump's response is important because sometimes you see him adjust. I've told you this caricature of him as a bumbling, quote unquote, angry idiot, end quote. It's not only you could say unfair, it's not true. Sometimes he has a keen sense of things like I've told you he's been changing his position or claiming he has different positions on abortion because he sees his positions unpopular. He's been running from Project 2025 because he sees it's toxic in states that matter. But on these national security issues, Donald Trump is not adjusting. He is not tacking to the senator, to the center, and he's not responding to the substance of those serious people, including Dick Cheney, that I just showed you. What Donald Trump was doing over the weekend, and there is a reason I'm showing you this, we don't just show you anything and we don't just regurgitate lies around here, but this is important to fact check and show you. Donald Trump is vowing what sounds like deliberately violent or illegal order policies. Before I show you what he says, I'm going to put this law, as you see, I'm going to leave this on the screen for a moment, because U.S. law enforcement are not supposed to escalate encounters, let alone aim for bloody border patrol. Indeed, under law, using deadly force is illegal unless an officer faces an individually grave, measurable risk of harm. Those rules bind all U.S. law enforcement, including border patrol. And that brings me to what Trump is now vowing over the weekend. And this should be known so you understand what we get from Trump tomorrow night at the debate might not be this extreme. He might even run right away from this. But to his base, with that programming, he is campaigning on what he says he will do, that he will order officials to go past what I just showed you the law is, that he will do, quote, bloody border enforcement, that he will have people, quote, killed immediately for returning to the U.S. border. Getting them out will be a bloody story. You should have never been allowed to come into our country. If you come back, you will be executed. You will be killed immediately. Not going to be easy, but we'll do it. That's what he's running on in public. Even as he might run away from it because he has some political and PR instincts tomorrow night. Fact check. What you just heard him say, the former president, current Republican nominee, 
is requesting an illegal order. So those are the kind of orders that, if issued, are still immediately illegal. There is no immediate kill policy allowed. U.S. officials take an oath to the Constitution, not to any president, even Donald Trump and whatever he thinks he can order, even if he's reelected. U.S. officials would have an obligation to resist that kind of unlawful order. And separately, groups might sue to try to get a court injunction preventing anyone from just doing immediate executions on the border. And this is not just me as a lawyer turned news anchor reminding you of some technicalities. We have precedents. Judges swiftly halted Trump's immigration bans because they were found to be likely to be unlawful. So they were halted pending further court review, which means even though he said do it, everyone who follows the Constitution, people in law enforcement, DHS, said no. And by the way, that travel ban did not involve something as extreme as people being, quote, killed immediately, end quote. But it was still halted. At the same rally, I want you to know that Donald Trump made the authoritarian claim, quote, this might be our last election. And over the weekend, he posted lies about the election and made a vow to jail lawyers, operatives, donors, and, quote, illegal voters, basically, who cross him. That's drawn condemnation from election officials, many noting that such rhetoric could provoke violence. Could provoke violence is a careful sentence, but basically an understatement. It's not just a risk of what could happen that may or may not happen. It's the logical outcome and thus likely foreseeable intent of the same person who fanned the flames of the last insurrection with the big lie, which led to the violent storming of the Capitol, an attempted coup, and many people, including Trump supporters, sitting in prison right now over that. There is a real link from Trump's lies to the damage that Harris aims to address in real time when this really goes down tomorrow night. While she also has to do the balance of advocating her vision and not getting completely buried in responding to Trump, which is the debate balance I mentioned early, earlier in this breakdown. And that's, again, not a blue or red thing, not a Democrat or Republican thing. If you're old enough to remember those early Republican debates, that balance, how much do you respond to him without looking like all of your time in the debate is about him, which in a weird way makes him larger even if it criticizes him, that balance has confounded Republicans who thought they could stop him when he first appeared and who initially dismissed his type of lies and bluster and debate performances as a kind of flash in the pan back in the day. And remember, if you're getting ready for tomorrow night and going, oh, Donald Trump's going to blow it, Democrats also had to witness how Trump managed to strike a less voluble mode that worked strategically during President Biden's clearly wobbly debate performance this summer. And I got to tell you, this is true in the courtroom or in a debate. It is a mark of skill, if you are already winning, to know when to drop back or calm down because you don't need to say more. The other side is helping you win. Harris's team knows all this, best we can tell. And they also know one reason they are currently doing better in the state polls that matter than the same Democratic ticket seemed to be doing a few months ago when she was the running mate and not the nominee. Right now, I'm going to do what I do around here sometimes, tell you something you already know. The Harris campaign sees that Democrats and her side are more excited than they were a few months ago because they have something affirmative. Her energy, her positivity, the idea of turning the page with a new leader for the country. And that is different than just warning about the very real dangers of more Trumpism, which I just showed you with facts, is out there this weekend and cannot be ignored either. Just ahead of the first and perhaps only presidential debate between Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris, the ex-president reminding us all just why former Vice President Dick Cheney, former Republican Congresswoman Liz Cheney, decided to vote for the Democratic nominee this year, why decorated generals and career military officials who despise the very idea of being involved in our politics are speaking out for the first time, why this is not a normal election in any way, certainly not one defined by policy debates.
In one fell swoop, Donald Trump laid the groundwork to dispute the 2024 election, just as he did in 2020. He threatened mass arrests of election officials, political opponents, and critics. It landed like a thunderclap in a Saturday night Truth Social post. It read in part, quote, when I win, those people that cheated will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law, which will include long-term prison sentences so that this depravity of justice does not happen again. Please beware that this legal exposure extends to lawyers, political operatives, donors, illegal voters, and corrupt election officials. Those involved in unscrupulous behavior will be sought out, caught and prosecuted at levels unfortunately never seen before in our country. And now you should know it includes a lot of nonsensical caps, but a couple of long words that make me wonder who wrote it. We decided to read it to you though, because it's long past time to include what he's saying to ignore what he's saying or to dismiss it as the rantings of an angry and embittered and delusional man. He's all those things. But he often sounds addled and confused. And so we gloss over these things. But this time he's lashing out at the justice system and the election system as he faces a trial for an attempted coup an actual prison time for the election interference case. Although all of that is true. The country has been drinking from the fire hose of Trump's lies and conspiracies for so many years now. It often feels like too many of us have become numb to these kinds of pronouncements, these series of threats from Trump. But at this point, what, 57 days out, to ignore what he's saying is to ignore our political reality and focus instead on a horse race or a tightening of polls. We're not going to do that. Trump is all the things we said. He's addled, he's delusional. The things he writes have bizarre, nonsensical fragments of sentences. They're grammatically incorrect. But he is the Republican presidential nominee, and tomorrow he'll be treated that way. He'll be on stage alongside the only person in the country who could stop him from acting on all the crazy stuff he posted about. Axios reports it like this, quote, Trump proposed two of the largest ever federal arrests of people living in America, including U.S. citizens, if he's reelected, the other being a roundup of millions of undocumented immigrants. We already know what happens when Trump turns his megaphone on election officials and critics. This from the January 6th Select Committee. Stop the steal! Stop the steal! Stop the steal! You're a threat to democracy. You're a threat to free and honest elections. And then about 45 minutes later, we started to hear the noises outside my home and that's I, my stomach sunk and I thought it's me and they're and, and then it's just we don't know what's gonna I mean the uncertainty of that was what was the fear like are they coming with guns are they gonna attack my house I'm in here with my kid I've lost my name and I've lost my reputation I've lost my sense of security all because a group of people starting with number 45 and his ally, Rudy Giuliani, decided to scapegoat me and my daughter, Shay, to push their own lies about how the presidential election was stolen. This turned my life upside down. Um, I no longer give out my business card. I don't transfer calls. I um, don't want anyone knowing my name. So what he's posting about is doing that at a national level. And he's going to be on the threats. He's going to be on the proposals that are in black and white in Project 2025 or the promises of his allies and aides that they make day after day in right-wing media. Trump is now making it clear 
that he will, as the Harris campaign said in a statement, quote, use his unchecked power to prosecute his enemies and pardon insurrectionists who violently attacked our Capitol on January 6th. The Republican presidential nominee promising to imprison scores of political opponents and critics ahead of the first presidential debate with Vice President Harris is where we begin today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. With us at the table, Democratic strategist and professor at Columbia University, MSNBC political analyst Basil Smichels here, plus NBC News correspondent Von Hilliard's here. Also joining us, White House reporter for The Washington Post, Tyler Pagers here. Claire McCaskill will be here in a couple of minutes. Um, Von Hilliard, I start with you. There's a sameness to the Trump story, right? It's been going on for nine years and we call on you and you deepen our understanding of what he says. But I think what we know through your lens is there's a deepening of the extrajudicial reliance. There's a deepening of the socializing with his supporters, the potential for violence and mass prosecutions and mass imprisonments. Why? When we talk about right, mass potential prosecutions, we're talking about a Department of Justice that is not one run by Bill Barr uh, as Attorney General. You're talking about a White House counsel that is not Don McGahn. You are talking about Donald Trump ensuring in January of 2025 that he surrounds himself by political appointees who want to execute on what could very well be a vast conspiracy charge. You are looking at somebody like Stephen Richer, Maricopa County recorder. He's a Republican. I just was on the phone with him just a bit ago here. He's one of those elections officials who faced a lot of heat in 2022. And he said his concern looking at a social media post like that from Donald Trump is not only the threat of re retaliation come 2025 and the prosecution, but it's the, the threat that some of these elections officials could very well feel in real time when Trump makes unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud. And the target becomes somebody like Stephen Richer, who is unable, because it doesn't exist, unable to prove the fraud or the cheating. And that is where you sort of have this double, double hit taking place. And then you get to 2025, and we can go much more into this. We're working on a story here in real time about this, because there are allies of Donald Trump who want to ensure that he has an attorney general, and it may not be one, that is confirmed by the Senate, but it would be an acting attorney general who can go in and has the same legal capabilities of an attorney general. So you may have Lisa Murkowski, Susan Collins, Bill Cassidy, Republican members of the Senate who vote no on Donald Trump's pick. But in the meantime, there's a lot that can take place in those first 100 days of administration. And in real time, you could have private citizens now working up what could amount to a vast conspiracy charge to begin the effort to a uh, a grand jury and begin to see that an indictment comes within short order in early 2025. If he wins. If, if he Trump wins. wins. If Trump wins. But I, I will say, though, in 2016, Donald Trump won. He said, though, that millions of other voters that did not count. They had that guy from Kansas do that. Correct, Chris Kobach. Yeah. And so you're looking at a reality yeah. that Donald Trump, who is claiming that he won in 2020 the state of California, despite losing by five million, potentially still claiming voter fraud, even if he wins. So we could spend the next two hours sort of going through and unpacking everything you just shared with us. Let, let me start with this. There will be no Don McGann's or Bill Barr. Let me just remind our audience, I actually think our audience knows, but just for the record, they oversaw the child separation policy. They didn't quit because that was too extreme or inhumane. They oversaw the most. I mean, they were not stewards of benevolence. They were not safeguards of the rule of law. What Don McGahn did is sort of in, in a look back seems to be protecting himself from being an accomplice to obstruction of justice. If you read the second volume of Mueller, maybe the record reflects something else. And what Bill Barr did after putting his thumbs on the scale of justice to the point where he repelled lifelong prosecutors from cases in the department, he said um, he thinks a coup is too far. So just, you know, with that frame, with, with you know, Bill, Bill Barr and Don McGahn are all the way over here on the right. What is on the other side? There's a, an individual by the name of Mike Davis, and I was talking to Mike Davis earlier today. He used to be a Grassley aide. He is somebody who is running a conservative uh, legal group that is aligned with Donald Trump, very close with the likes of Steve Bannon and others. Don Jr. has floated him openly as— Don Jr. who picked 
J.D. Vance is still nominating people? He's openly <laughs> said that he should be a good acting attorney general, somebody that could, in the first months, execute on what would be those vast indictments. I was talking with Mike Davis earlier. He said he doesn't believe he could constitutionally be the acting attorney general, but there are individuals who could. And Mike Davis told me that, as an example, that Democrats need to be prepared for, again, I keep coming to this conspiracy charge that could come out of Fort Pierce because, as Mike Davis tells me, you had the search warrant execution by the FBI at Mar-a-Lago, which Donald Trump has claimed was unlawful. You could go and have somebody as an acting attorney general go and seek this indictment out of Fort Pierce, where you could potentially have a more favorable jury pool, favorable to Donald Trump. And in that conspiracy indictment, you could loop in the likes of Fonnie Willis, you, Matthew Colangelo, Alvin Bragg. Really, you know, I was talking to a, a, a legal ethics uh, professor out of NYU a few moments ago. He told me it doesn't take much to get an indictment, as we know, right? The old saying, a ham sandwich. And if they truly indeed want to go through with this, there's little barriers. Because if Donald Trump were to implement the executive order and Schedule F that he did at the very end of his first administration, the Joe Biden rescinded on day one, they would be able to go and fire a vast number of career officials and turn those into political appointment positions. So while you may have some career DOJ officials who would not want to do Donald Trump's bidding, you could argue, Donald Trump could very well in those first months come in, move those people out from being career officials, turn them into political appointment positions, and it's not that hard to see how indictments come to there soon after. Donald so I got to start with you, Governor. If you were coaching Kamala Harris and said, here's what you might not expect from Donald Trump or you don't see when you watch it on TV, is there something people should know about what it's like to be on that stage against him? Yeah, you go on that stage. Look, she has a tremendous opportunity to really make a difference in terms of where this race is going. If she can, number one, uh, explain to people really who she is, what her policies are, and this is a little tricky part, to be also separate herself from Joe Biden. You know, Trump's going to be saying all the time that, you know, you were with Biden here, you were with Biden there. I think she needs to be able to say, look, I, you're not debating Joe Biden. I'm, I'm Kamala Harris, and, and I've got my own ideas. And I think if she can show a sense of gravity, a sense of, uh, of real strength, and getting into a, some kind of a back and forth with Donald Trump is, frankly, I think, a waste of time and a waste of the precious minutes she's going to have to communicate to the American people. For Trump, if he goes off and starts, you know, attacking her, and I think it's a real loser. And I think his position should be he's going to defend his record, say his economic program was better than Joe Biden's, and ask her about her flip-flops. You know, who is the real Kamala Harris? What do you really believe? But I think for her, there's so much to gain and such an opportunity to have a major impact on this race. And probably if she does well, this would probably be the last debate. So watch it this time because it's like Haley's Comet. It's probably not coming back for a long time. So, I, Jess, I'm wondering because I think he used a couple of words that are important. Gravity, strength. I would add to that um, intellect, smarts, right? I, I want my president to be a lot smarter than I am. I certainly want them to have a certain level of gravitas and strength. But do they judge women still differently on a debate stage than they judge men? Well, certainly. I mean, we've seen that for sure. We're going to we're going to judge women differently and that's going to continue to be the case. But I think I think that uh, what this debate is going to show us, there's a couple of things. Donald Trump remains Donald Trump. He wants to be the center of attention. He's a classic bully. He's going to come in insecure um, and probably a little bit unprepared on some of these issues. We've seen some incoherence on some of the issues that he's been asked about in this last week. Um, and I think, you know, he's not going to get away with some of the things he's gotten away with in the past because he's going up against. Um, someone who's going to hold him a little bit accountable to some of these things. We've learned a lot in the last uh, few years in dealing with Donald Trump. And I think Kamala Harris, as a prosecutor, she's going to make the case. And I think she has an opportunity to show her command of the issues. She has an opportunity to show a contrast, a clear contrast that isn't hypothetical anymore. And I think we're going to see um, something that looks very different than what we've seen in the past. I think, um, Chuck, that, that the governor said something else that's really important. Yeah. Every minute counts. She's going to have a limited amount of time to try to do a lot of stuff. Right. What should be at the top of that list? Well, I want to sort of 
emphasize what the governor was saying there, because I expect this debate to be asymmetrical in, in how it looks, I think, to the average viewer. And here's why, because I do think both of them have different pieces of the electorate they have to talk to. Uh, I agree with Governor Kasich about what, what the vice president needs to do, right? He, it, she needs to establish her own identity a little bit, find some distance. So it's a separate conversation. She needs to talk to some voters who may not agree with uh, some of her ideas, and she needs to figure out a way to reassure those voters that, hey, they have a voice in her administration um, without looking, you know, without looking like she's trying to, like, overly placate them and cause problems on her base. What she's got to be careful of is that Donald Trump is trying to get a different voter, right? He's trying to talk to voters who don't always, aren't always engaged. He's trying to talk to voters that, that he thinks already agree with sort of his uh, MAGA populism. And so I think the, the danger here for the vice president is, is wanting to engage uh, uh, on the issues or on the specifics that the former president is going to want to engage in because he's trying to talk to different voters than she is. This is such an unusual general election debate. And, and normally, you know, you'd go back to our, our pre our pre Trump era politics. Romney and Obama were actually talking to the same group of voters in their debates because they were the ones that were up for grabs. There's such a weird grouping of, of these, these two coalitions. Their theories of how they win this election are different. So I think mm. that's where it's going to take real discipline for the vice president to sort of stick to her plan, regardless of whatever Donald Trump is doing. She has to put on, you know, blinders the way they do mm -hmm. that with horse racing, where you don't see you don't see your participant. <laughs> she can't get caught up too much in what he's saying. Yeah, I think um, just the Times notes that Harris has at least in the plan ditched uh, uh, the strategy uh, that Hillary Clinton had of denouncing Trump as a racist or a misogynist uh, because her aides believe it's a waste of time to tell people what a, a, a terrible person he is. Most people have already made a decision, right, if he's a terrible guy or, or he's their savior. And yet you do see figures like Congresswoman Liz Cheney calling Donald Trump and J.D. Vance misogynistic pigs. That's a direct quote from uh, her her interview when she announced that she was going to be uh, endorsing, her dad was going to be endorsing. How much do you think Harris should lean into the Trump Vance view of women beyond abortion, beyond going into their health care and their and their decisions in their bedrooms? Look, women tend to decide elections in this country, and I think there's some opportunities for the vice president as she goes into this debate. Um, right now, there's an opportunity, I think, with young women to speak to young women and to engage them in a way that they haven't yet been engaged. Just over 50 percent still haven't registered to vote. Um, and there's an opportunity with women under 30 to have a conversation with them and to draw contrast and to draw them into their future. And I think that's why you're seeing a campaign that's trying to be future-oriented. I think we've also seen a swing with white women. Um, um, in the pre-convention era, Donald Trump had a lead there. Now it's pretty much a dead heat, so she's closing the gap with white women. There are different people. Chuck's right. There are different people that she should be talking to and will be talking to. I don't think she. I don't think she needs to resort to definitions and calling things out. I think what she's going to do is talk about the policies and how it impacts people and how it impacts not just women, but working families and middle-income Americans, um, because that's what it is. And she's. That's why you see her talking right now about. An, um, you know, opportunity economy that deals with child care. Um, you know, Donald Trump didn't have a coherent answer on that this week. Things like housing, things like grocery prices. She understands she's got to meet people on the economy and, and on economic issues. And I think we're going to hear about that. And those contrasts are pretty, pretty far and wide. So there is substance. And as you know, Governor, there is also perceptions. We can all remember the sweating by Richard Nixon. And we could go on and on checking your watch yeah. like you're bored uh, being yeah. at the debate, so on and so forth. Um, I, I happen to be in Ohio over the weekend at a large gathering where, as I often am, I was surprised by the perceptions, the questions I was getting. I want to ask you about after your presidential debate and people's perceptions versus what your perception was. And I ask it in this context that um, over the weekend, we saw Trump claim that no boxes or artificial lifts would be allowed on stage, that that would be cheating. How much does do you think, and in your experience, does the visual representation, how you look, how you stand, how you present yourself, anything yeah. that you might betray emotions with <laughs> on your face play in? Yeah. 
and how you felt you did versus other people? It's a really good question. I mean, first of all, I had to find the cameras. You know, you got so many cameras in the room and you got all the people out there. So first of all, you have to find a camera. And then the second thing, which was hard for me, Chuck will agree with this, is you got to know when to say what you have to say and shut up. Don't step on your own lines. And so communicate what you want to say. And if you do it effectively, then you'll get the applause or you'll get people. In this case, it won't be applause, but you'll get uh, the fact that people will assent what you have to say. But there's one other thing we haven't touched on here that I'm sure would come up before we finish, and that is her message is, hey, you want a generational change? You want to turn the page? I mean, part of it is this is really something interesting. She could, uh, there's possibility exists. I'm not saying it will. Possibility exists that Donald Trump turns into Joe Biden. He's the old guy, right? And she's, she's the young next generation. I think her pitch about the fact that you were all frustrated in this country, you didn't have a choice, now you do. And you have a choice of one generation versus the other, and this is what I'm going to do. I think that would be effective and interesting, and, it, and she's going to look the part. She doesn't have to, she doesn't have to act to look the part. She is younger than, than Donald Trump. Yeah, she's younger, obviously, uh, than Donald Trump. But I think energy-wise, Donald Trump can often match pretty much anybody, yeah. at least in terms of Chuck, uh, <laughs> the way he puts his message out there. What do you think could, could make or break it for him? We've talked a lot about what Kamala Harris yeah. has to do. A lot of people think this is her chance to introduce. And right. it is, right? Because we know the poll show. A lot of people don't know what she stands for. So this is right. critically important. But... What's the biggest pitfall for Donald Trump? Well, I think it goes to something that Governor Kasich said at the very beginning of our segment here, um, hinting that, that, you know, he could really lose in this debate, right? I don't know what a win for him looks like that he can orchestrate other than having his opponent like what happened the last time, because he didn't perform very well in the last debate, right? It, you know, it's just that nobody noticed that he didn't really have some coherent answers of his own really didn't notice some of the weird grievances he went down. I mean, I, my own son goes, w went on his TikTok feed and he goes, did Donald Trump talk about sleeping with a porn star during the first debate? <laughs> that is what broke through his TikTok feed, okay? the 17 year old, so you can judge all you want there on that. But the point being is, you know, Donald Trump really wasn't very good at this. And if he goes after her in the ways he went after Hillary Clinton, and, and I'll tell you, you know, Hillary Clinton, Look, she was a very polarizing figure in 2016, and 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 sh and in some ways the public, uh, why they did I don't know, sort of accepted his harsh attacks on her in a way that I don't think he uses those same techniques on Kamala Harris. I think they're likely to boomerang badly in his direction. So that's that's what I think he, his inability to not go on the attack in a personal way against her. His inability to sort of restrain himself on those things is what I think is his biggest risk here, which is where, look, I'm going to assume there is a second debate. But if there's not, it'll be because he, could, he, was, he couldn't help himself on the personal.